1996, author David Foster Wallace released his magnum opus, Infinite Jest, an 1,100-page post-postmodern takedown of the great American novel. It was a smash success all throughout the world. Unfortunately, it just wasn't very good. Famously dense and nigh unfinishable, the book earned a backlash as great as its praise. Join me, Jesse Dram, as we untangle this tale of boredom, addiction, and French-Canadian separatists in our quest of understanding on the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast, your one-stop shop for hating modern literature needs. I, my name is Jesse Dram. I am your host as always. I'm a stand-up comedian, and I'm a fan of books. Just not this one. That's right. I don't know why I'm talking as if this is like the first episode and I'm doing a reintroduction. Maybe because it's 11. 11 is a very important number in numerology. It means rebirth. And I made that up on the spot, so you know it must be true. Our guest this week is musician and writer... Stevie McFly. Stevie came at the recommendation of Cat 2 King. She was in episode 3. Talk about some interesting stuff here. We talk, uh, Stevie's not a fan of the book, so we get into that. We talk about why exactly you would wait 300 pages in to physically describe the ailments and you know makeup and deformities of a character we've met it's in the first chapter. Like, why would you do such a thing? Who's to know? I'm sure someone will message me on why it's a great idea and worthy of a MacArthur Genius Grant. And that person, I, I pre-salute you, because you're doing the Lord's work, I'll tell you. Um, we talk about... We talk about Andrea Dworkin's effect on a pro-rector named Thode and her class, which is about that... Uh, breastfeeding children is sexual assault. That, yes, the, the child needing to be fed from a woman's breast is sexual assault. Obviously, that's meant to be silly. What's not meant to be silly is the fact that numerous characters in this book, David Foster Wallace has t- put in his personal and so but when, so then what, so but then when. And anybody else, the simple fact that it is ascribed to different characters, I mean, it seems right there like, oh, this isn't something specific with this character. This guy is a poor writer, which is why he's just putting it on whoever he happens to be typing for at that moment, and he would be fairly criticized if he were anybody else except for this guy. We talk a little bit about David Foster Wallace's breadcrumb, my personal breadcrumb theory, that that is how this thing wins so many viewers, viewers, readers over, simply because it's... uh, it's not that it's a good story. Or, there's good stuff in there. But by and large, like, it's just, it's, it's poor structure, but, but it's rewarding you. It's giving you little bleeps and bloops there. Like, oh, so-and-so is connected. Okay, that, that feels good as opposed to, like, being a regular novel and just, um, I, I noticed when I'm reading my notes for this, I put the word reveal a lot. Probably due to the fact that no action happens in this novel, at most, it's people talking about actions that happened in the past. Like, we don't read about James and Candence's suicide in the moment from his point of view. We hear the gruesome details as Hal and Orin lazily sit around clipping toenails and recounting the story to each other. So, I don't know. What? Oh, are you on the phone? No, I'm recording the intro. Oh, no, no, that, 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 that's okay. Perry, would you like to come here? And... Come on, you, you got something to say. No. Is it about the lights? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I love you. I love you, annoying woman. <laughs> I'm not an annoying man just because I fart constantly and I'm gross and and I, I screw up easy serial killer quizzo questions. Good night. Good night. That's Perry. You might remember her from the footnote episode, This is Water. She just wandered out in her eye mask and my Motel Health shirt, which she looks super cute in. Where was I? Oh, yeah, fuck David Foster Wallace. <laughs> Matt, th- this, is, this is a decent chunk of the book. Although, again, another thing we point out here, we started doing the uh, word of the week. Last week's word was phoneme. 
which is the smallest, it's like the smallest vocal part of a word. Uh, the example being, if you were to pronounce the word cat as cat, you are pronouncing the phonemes. This instance, the word is neurasthenia. Neurasthenia, which is a, a, a psychological irritability. Yeah, an irritability caused by uh, emotional instability. But it is said by it's said in the voice of a character who is a drug addict who unless there is some revelation at some point that he is a child of linguists guess what that's terrible fucking writing there is no reason for this person to use that word right there except for anything else other than david foster wallace to print out a nice little fucking bumper sticker to say i'm smarter than your literary hero it's just i don't get uh, there are good parts of this book. I'm, I'm reading ahead right now, and there are good ones. I don't understand why people defend the bad stuff so much. It's dumb. Anyway, sorry. I'm being very off-putting for a very long episode. Um, again, Stevie McFly. You can find him online at Stevie X McFly on uh, Twitter. Just type in Stevie McFly on Twitter. He was the first one that popped up for me. And I think he's also Stevie X McFly on Instagram. He had a lot of cool takes. Um, he is our first guest of... Fuck. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Stevie is our first guest of color, which I don't, you know, want to pat... I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I just want to let you know that we do get into some of the racial aspects, particularly what I uh, really complained about in episode two or three, I believe, which is, you know... War, War Dean Mama say she gonna come hit a War Dean gonna come cry like that's just yeah so it, it was nice getting that perspective but yeah overall we just really just kind of dug into this one and tried to figure out what the fuck was going on um I did the Nerds with Words podcast yesterday that was with Neil Wood and Adam Nutter Neil Wood's a good friend of mine Adam Nutter is too check out their comedy check out their podcast Nerds with Words the <laughs> the the, the uh, impetus for that podcast was that Adam is a big fan of comic books. So I have laughingly joked with him in the past that, you know, he is a child and comic books are for children and he should grow up. So we threw down a challenge to each other. Of, I, I was to read the five-issue series Super Gods graphic novel, which is pretty interesting. I'll give it that. I read it in like 15 minutes, but that's besides the point. And I tasked him with reading Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut, which uh, I don't think he liked it. Full disclosure, Adam has brain damage from uh, both MMA training and injuries sustained while being a New York City police officer in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s. So, yeah, he, he's, he's not great at retaining stuff. I, I don't say this is an insult. I say what it was. But what I will say is an insult is that the rest of the podcast was us uh, doing our best to debunk his libertarian ideology. That was fun. That was fun. So go listen to that podcast, Nerds with Words. They're, they're great guys. Go check them out. And uh, I guess that's it for this week. So check it out. Here it is. Stevie McFly, episode 11, pages 299 to 321, including the gargantuan unnecessary as a footnote footnote 110 18 pages which could have easily just been 18 pages of a chapter but then it wouldn't be all post postmodern and wonky and fucking interesting now would it episode 11 stevie mcfly can i help you perry you're sitting there looking at me <laughs> episode 11 Guys, please follow the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast group on Facebook. You can follow me at Jesse Dram on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, at Diamond Joe Quinn on Reddit. Again, not trying to be dirty, just ran out of characters. At Jesse Dram at gmail.com. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know how we can improve. Let me know where I'm wrong. I'm not, but you can try. Here we go. Episode 11. <laughs> Okay, here we are. Episode 11 of the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast. My guest this week on recommendation of uh, Katu King, episode three. He is Stevie McFly. How you doing, Stevie? I'm good. How are you? 
Doing very good. Very good. You came highly recommended from uh, Katu. So if you could just give us quick your uh, your background, anything you want to promote, what, you know, I, I know she described you as a, as a writer. So I don't know, anything you feel like promoting in there, your social media or whatnot. Yeah. So uh, I'm on Twitter as, uh, you know, my handle is Stevie X McFly. Um, that's pretty much all that's going on right now. The, uh, the pandemic thing, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be an opportunity to write, but, um, no, just really more of an opportunity for despair, crushing despair. <laughs> uh, but you know, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm working on a few things, but nothing really to promote at the moment. Mm -hmm. God, I, I remember when I got laid off like six, seven weeks ago, my first thought was, oh man, I'm going to get so much writing done. Mm -hmm. And that's not exactly how it happened. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you were recommended by Katu. Um, what is your, what, uh, ow, well, just to put it out there, I know a few people have been asking, this is an audio podcast, so out there to the listeners, people have been asking for more, uh, more, more diversity. Uh, Katu recommended you both as a respect as an artist, but also as a person of color, which I'm mm -hmm. actually very curious for this book because I had some people complain like, oh, you should have a person of color on. But I feel like this book in particular is very, very like it, it appeals to people. I don't want to just put that on everybody, but th th this has been described as a very white book by some of its detractors. Yeah, it's an extraordinarily white book. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I don't know, like, I don't talk about the book a lot, so, like, you know, some of my black friends may have read the book, and I just don't know, but it's not a book that I've heard talked about by a lot of people who are not white dudes. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, when I first tried, like, I tried to read it first uh, years ago, and I didn't stop because it was like a difficult read as such, you know, I stopped because uh, every, like the way that he writes black characters makes me think that he's never even seen a movie with a black person in it. He never like watched an episode of the Fresh Prince. He never like saw good times on fucking Nick at night. Like he just never, uh, let alone spoke to a black person. Um, and like, you know, the black people in the book don't show up very often, but like by the second or third time, I was just like, nah, I can't do this. This is not for me. Yeah. Like I'm, I am not easily offended, but when I first saw that early in the book where uh, I've described it as he just puts on blackface for like six pages, like Wadeen mama going to come beat her. Like, I don't like this. She, she be all. cry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, some uh, some people messaged me about that. I could be uncharitable and say they were apologists, but mm -hmm. uh, apparently they had a thing like, oh, well, that was from a thing. And, you know, the natural David Foster Wallace thing. Like, well, it only seems bad if you don't know every iota of his backstory and history. Like, oh, like a regular person then. Okay. But apparently he, that was a specific reference to something like where he had been told to write realistically. So he did that essentially to like, troll a, a college professor like well you told me to write realistically and that's the way i've seen people like that talk so basically he, like he intentionally made it racist to make a point i've never read that anywhere except from what this one person was telling me so i don't yeah that sounds uh worse <laughs> because like you know i don't know man like if i if i didn't if, if i was supposed to if, okay if i was trying to write realistically Mm -hmm. And it was a culture I didn't know. Like, I'm just not familiar with it or whatever. Um, I would at least, I mean, okay, so it's the 90s. The, searching the internet is not as easy. But, like, maybe go ask your friends, like, hey, do you know a black person? Like, <laughs> does anybody anybody here know a bla any black person? Like, one of them mm -hmm. around somewhere? <laughs> just just poke your head to the diner. Like, has anybody seen a black person lately? I could really, I, I, I have use for... Uh... <laughs> And right. Use for a black person. Can, 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 can you look this over and make sure it doesn't sound ridiculous? <laughs> oh God! Yeah, not a not a not a lot of people of color at the old tennis academy. I guess. Right. But um, so I I also I read like four hundred pages my very first time, and I just I I feel like so many people 
are like, oh, well, people don't finish it because it's a big book. Like, it's mm-hmm. it, the thing that makes it a hard read is not its length. That contributes. No. It is 100% the way it is written. Like, I said last week's episode where we finally get some time with Don Gately. And my main thing was like, I, I love this chapter. Why the fuck is it happening on page 250? Like, mm-hmm. If this was on 40, this would be something else entirely. But this book really right. does try to, like, Stockholm Syndrome you by just, like, confusing you. And then every – it pretty much – it spins you in a circle. And every now and again, it gives you, like, a little bit of basis of, like, oh, this is where I am. I feel rewarded now. But that doesn't mean it's good. I don't know. Yeah. In, in this chapter, like, um, you know, when we, we get some background on Mario, mm-hmm. you know, and, like, I – uh, I did procrastinate on, on reading. So I did, you know, I, I started, you know, trying again to read from the beginning and I was going to power through, you know, kind of to, to the part where we're, you know, discussing. Uh, and I ended up skipping a bunch of it just for making sure I at least got this section you know, uh-huh. before we discussed it. But like, we're like post page 300 and it's like, oh, by the way, this character who has appeared repeatedly, here's what he looks like. And this whole important, yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, he has cocky skin and is like an elf, by the way. Like, he's like three feet tall and his feet are blocks and he has dolphin teeth. Um, you know, it's like, wait, haven't we seen him repeatedly before this? This is a character who's been around right. pretty much from the first, within the first, like, 40 pages he shows up. And just now we're like, yeah, by the way, like uh, he has fake eyelids and um, <laughs> he, he, uh, his nose, his nose flaps when he, when he sleeps. Mm-hmm. Well, I almost feel like people who love the book that they look at that as that, like that little breadcrumb, like, Oh, M- Millicent Kent said he had the nicest eyelashes. He's paying that off. Like that doesn't, that does not seem enough of a payoff to me to really necessitate putting it so far away from everything else. Like it does yeah. I don't know. Whatever, whatever reward center of the brain lights up for people who read this book, it does not. It's working a little bit on me, but it's more annoying me that, that, that this weird tactic I don't like is working as opposed to making me a fan right. of it. Right. It, it, it's, it's like kind of a pretentious and cutesy version of there's, there's a moment. Um, this is going to be like a weird comparison. You know the song um, uh, Hell Yeah Fucking Right by, by uh, Drake featuring Lil Wayne? I don't. Okay. Well, in that song, Lil Wayne's verse, um, uh, he's like, uh, she started undressing and started confessing and asked me to hold her. And so I did, but that was last month. And like, when he just throws in, but that was last month, it every time throws me off because it's Uh just like, wait, what? Like, suddenly, (laughs) like the late establishment of the time frame, Mm -hmm. you know, well, see, that can be used to good effect, but like, you know, it's funny. I'm about to do something very, very white because I'm about to give my own comparison and it cannot be whiter at all because it's like a 1940 song. But mm-hmm. if it inherently, if, it, if the detail is put at the end, but it inherently changes how you've seen the entire thing, then I can see that as like a literary tool, like something mm-hmm. like that. It doesn't really add anything that it was last month. Right. But I, I remember this specifically. So my cousin uh, had a baby and she had a little girl and they lived on a street that was called Shady Lane. And her mm-hmm. grandmother came over to see the baby and started singing the song from the 40s. And it's called like, oh, the little lady on Shady Lane. And mm-hmm. pretty much everything in the song, like, oh, there's there's people going in and out all night. And, you know, oh, the men can't wait to get their hands on her. And then the very last line of the song is, and she's only three days old. So the whole right. like. Yeah, so the whole idea that, being, and that's, that's funny. That's a good bit. Right. So that, but, but, but I'm saying it has a purpose there. Right. At least. It, it is changing. None of this with Mario is really changing the way I saw him previously. It's right. just, it, I mean, it's giving a little more grotesquery. And you know what's funny? I've even seen, uh, I mention him every podcast. There's a Tumblr artist who goes under the name Infinite Jensen, who mm-hmm. he's done like a hundred sketches from the book. And you can see the difference between like, oh, he clearly drew Mario here from page like a hundred and something, because then all of a sudden he gets like more reptilian looking. Right. And it's, yeah, because you kind of picture him like, ah, he's a little, you know, he's a little messed up looking. The the way, unfortunately, you see some people like with like a minor deformity. Mm -hmm. 
and now he just he 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 seems like you know the missing link from this uh right like he seems um one. uh mighty boosh you've seen the mighty boosh right yeah um the character played by uh noel fielding's brother uh the short one uh, i haven't seen in a while that that one's slipping past me Okay, so Noel Fielding's brother, a character, God, the name is the name is uh, escaping me right now, but he, um, you know, their brothers. There's like a foot in height difference between them, and he's a little weird looking. But like, that's kind of more what I expected. It's like, oh no, actually, he looks like, uh, you know, uh, one of the Goombas from the Mario Brothers movie. Um, exactly. And yeah. We just forgot to mention that. <laughs> well, also like. It, it would just, just by mentioning that, like, he's kind of frail and his two other brothers are, like, you know, a professional and an amateur athlete. Like, I think mm-hmm. that would distinguish, we're already getting enough just from the syntax, what the the difference is of him in the family without turning right. him into a literal, I guess I can't even say monster. Goomba's more like it. Like, yes, like the least threatening monster there. Yeah, like, a, like a, maybe a hobgoblin or a, or a kobold. Mm, right. Yeah. So, real quick, have you have you ever completed the book? Nope. No, you have not. Okay. See, that's where I was a little confused. I wasn't sure. Uh, okay. So, see, here's the thing. When I have had people on this podcast who have also not liked the book, the uh, the the listeners maintained that I t- I tend to hate the book more with people who haven't finished it and mm-hmm. also don't like it. So I'm always like a, a little hesitant now. Like, okay, I got to be careful. Make sure I'm not agreeing just to agree. But we'll right. see. <laughs> um, what, what is your what's your typical literary background? I mean, if you do a lot of writing, I imagine you must be quite a reader. What what is your background and taste? Yeah, I mean, like I have a very varied taste. You know, like um, I like I, I tend to go through phases. Like I went through a little phase a couple of years ago where I was just reading like oral histories of punk rock, like mm-hmm. please kill me under the big black sun uh, from the velvets to the voidoids, uh, et cetera. And so I just like for like maybe two months, just like read a bunch of those. Um, you know, I like literary fiction if it's, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little more uh, judgy about, like, a lot of, like, the quote-unquote, like, literary canon. Okay. Um, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, revered because of the time it came out or the context in which it came out mm-hmm. and is not necessarily so relevant now or there are things that are more worth reading. Okay, see, um, th- those are the books I tend to consider my favorites. So I'm, I'm curious if you have an example. Maybe there's a, a I don't have a good example off the of top mine. of my head, but like, I'm not, you know, I'm not disparaging all literary fiction, you know, like I love, mm. um, like from like the, the quote unquote canon, I do love like a lot of Twain. I like, um, you know, Hemingway, Sun Also Rises, you know, it's mm. a great one, um, you know, and even lesser known books by some of the like, you know, the, the, the more revered authors, like, um, God, one of my favorites that took me forever to read just because it was way too relevant, you know, um, during like the last election cycle, I read uh, Point Counterpoint by Huxley. Oh, okay. Have you read that one? I have not, no. So it's like, you know, it was written and, and set like between the world wars, uh, like during, you know, the, the rise of European fascism, mm. but like, at the point it was released, the only fascist power that actually was, you know, in power was uh, Mussolini. Okay. Um, so, like, Hitler hadn't even, he was known, but, like, you know, the Nazi party didn't have, they had, like, maybe a couple seats, you know, in the Reichstag. Like, they didn't, you know, they weren't, like, okay. uh, you know, they weren't in charge yet for several years. I think right. it was like, you, you, call, you called him on, like, step one and two of his rise to power. Right. And that's the and, world it's being written in at that point. Right. And um, so, like, it's an ensemble cast, um, and it's, like, mostly, like, writers, artists, socialites, whatever, in London. And until someone gets a telegram toward the end of the book, it really feels like it could be, like, two weeks ago, Brooklyn. Well, not two weeks ago now, uh, 
but two weeks before I read it, pre-quarantine, you know? Uh-huh. And, uh, like, there's one character who is a fascist, and nobody takes him seriously. Everybody just, like, they kind of make fun of his views, and, like, you know, when he lists them out, he sounds like a fucking, like, Reddit libertarian MRA. Like, <laughs> you know. Um, like, weirdly specifically so. But, uh-huh. uh like the only character that takes him seriously is, you know, this kind of put upon housewife whose husband is cheating on her, who like, he takes her seriously. He treats her like a person. Everyone else kind of dismisses her and she doesn't know what's going on. And so she just like is compelled and listens because he's saying, like he's uh, He's speaking to her, speaking to her and telling her that like she deserves more and you know, that she deserves strength that she's not, uh, being allowed to have and um, and then there's one character who like like low key like there's excerpts from like his diaries and he's like you know talking about how every time he sees this guy having and his organization having rallies in the park they're bigger and throughout the book every time someone like walks by a rally or something it's, just, it's okay. more and more people and it's not he doesn't draw too much specific attention to it but you notice it that this, the fascist movement is getting bigger and bigger and everyone thinks it's a joke and they're just writing it off as like this goofy bunch of people, you know, but like hmm. it's getting bigger and bigger the whole oh, time. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I definitely want to go read. You said it's called point counterpoint mm-hmm. by Huxley. Okay. I'll look into that. Cause yeah, just, I mean, it seems like uh, allegorical and symbolic, but like just talking about the fascist guy and how, like the put upon housewife is the only one. Like it, it sounds like you're describing to me how Trump won the won the Rust Belt. Just right. like yeah, like no, this is, this is terrible what you're going through. I'll, I'll I'll fix things for you. Right. So I'm yeah, I'm reading this book and I'm just like, oh god, he's gonna win. Yeah. He's, he's gonna fucking win because everyone's just making fun of the little fucking incel gamergate corner and not realizing that's getting bigger and bigger and it's spreading outside of that demographic and it's other people who feel disenfranchised fairly or unfairly or some combination thereof and it's growing but everyone's just making fun of it and not taking it seriously yeah see this is why i did uh i i, I did an appearance on a comedian this comedian lamar lee he has a show called a uh, feud which is very specifically having people on to argue and defend their horrible opinions. Mm -hmm. And one of my opinions was we need to take it a little easier on incels. And that, Mm -hmm. and that really was my argument. Like these are miserable, miserable people. Like the entire world has already said, fuck you to them. If, if you don't bring them in a little bit, somebody's going to weaponize that against you. Right. And you have to, you have to find a way to, to, to speak to them. Cause like, you know, I feel like a lot of us, you know, may, maybe as teenagers had a little bit of the old nice guy syndrome, mm-hmm. um, but thankfully didn't have people out there who were like, it's not your fault. It's actually everyone else's fault. And here's why. Yes. And, you know, misuse statistics or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. ways that they convince people that there's reason behind their belief that it's everyone else's fault we at some point had to go maybe i'm doing something wrong the common denominator here is me and figure out what that is rather than having like thousands of people telling you like no it's actually their fault and the world is against you but we are here for you exactly yeah i've been i mean i've been very open on this podcast that like in my early 20s i would honestly say that i was pretty involved in like and i say pretty involved in that like i read it and i argued it but uh, with like the nascent alt-right at that point, which at, mm-hmm. at that point I would say it was like some right-wing stuff, but it was mostly, this was coming out of the Bush era. It was like mm-hmm. right-wing without the evangelical aspect, without the right. religious aspect. And the race thing, like it was in there, but it wasn't quite the peak yet. Thank God I got out before mm-hmm. that. But my entire thing with that was I got into Ayn Rand and objectivism and libertarianism. Mm-hmm. And really the only thing is like, coming from uh i came from a very lower class like white working class white trash blue collar kind of background and Mm -hmm. that was just the thing that spoke to me that said like 
you know, you'll be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and everyone can do this if you just do that. Like that was what I needed to hear at that time to believe in myself. And then thankfully I got in the real world a little bit like, oh, this is a bunch of horse shit. I need to get the fuck away from this. But right. it, it was the thing that yelled out to me and said, hey, I give a shit about you right now. Give it a shot. I could have mm -hmm. fallen into anything and like i just think i've thought a million times how horrible my life would have been if i had not gotten out of that nonsense you know right yeah you know and i definitely like in high school had a had a friend who um like was trying to you know just touting libertarianism and like there was a period where i was like this sounds reasonable which is it's funny just like i was raised in a socialist household so like mm -hmm. that's kind of my background, but you know, um, there were, so, there were things about it that, that made sense on paper. And it was just like, basically, um, as, as I was like processing everything, the, the big, the big thing that, uh, brought me back to where I, you know, started essentially was, um, anything that had to do with, uh, race. I got you. Stevie, real quick, I think you might have your hand over one of the microphone things. You got a little muffled there. Better? Much better. Gotcha. Yeah, we could, we, we could hear you. It just got a little fuzzy there for a second. Yeah, I got you. But yeah, you said you backed out of it once you got any, like, the kind of race thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because, yeah, anytime anything about race came up, it, there was just, like, denial that racism exists and kind of blaming anything bad that happens on like black behavior right and as for for such an individualistic kind of ideology suddenly things get blamed on groups when they are groups other than the primary libertarian demographic of like white dudes right exactly yeah that's uh, that's just some of the shit that creeps in the sides i i literally that podcast i was doing right before this Mm -hmm. A good 40 minutes of it was me just arguing with my friend who's the host, but he's a big time libertarian. And mm. it was just, just pointing out like, dude, it's all, uh, all the ways things fell apart. It, it was a whole, it was a whole thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's get into some of the breakdown of this book. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, doing pages 299 to 321. We're doing less pages than usual because we had the gigantic footnote 110 in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, 299 to 306. Now, you said you went back and read some of the stuff leading up to this? So I, I, so I tried to, my plan, you know, when we first were discussing this was to just read from the beginning up to this point. Um, and so I read, I, I just started way later than I anticipated. And I read like the first maybe 100 pages. And then I was like, I got to skip ahead and read this section because... You know, we got to, I got to have to, you know, I have to read it to talk about it, but. I got you. Okay. Well, I asked that for a specific reason. Cause again, this mm -hmm. is this book. Uh, the first character we meet page 299 is Tony Krause, poor Tony, who we've only, we've met twice in the book so far. And mm -hmm. once, once we're getting that kind of, you know, uh, we're getting that kind of reward breadcrumb thing because one of those times we hadn't realized it was him. We were seeing, we find it out here. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know if you remember poor Tony, uh, poor Tony. We last met had been given a hot shot heroin dose that had killed one of his friends. Mm -hmm. They had left him for dead in a dumpster after, uh, yeah, after Dr. Wu had dosed them for giving in revenge for money that he owed them. <coughs> uh, poor Tony has been kicking heroin because he can't get it anywhere at this point, and he's too afraid to try, knowing what's out there. He has been drinking cough syrup to get around it, and he's having a seizure. He's been drinking cough syrup in the Armenian Foundation Library in Watertown, Massachusetts, um, where it's revealed. So there's a part here where, uh, a few chapters ago, where we have a very little blurb about a woman who got an artificial heart transplant Mm -hmm. but the artificial heart wasn't internal. She had to carry it in a purse next mm -hmm. to her. And then a purse snatcher snatched it from her, bas basically killing her, snatching her heart. We find out that that purse snatcher was this character, poor Tony, in drag. Right. And uh, honestly, at the time, they seemed to indicate that the drag was just 
like a costume, but now that we're getting into this, it seems that poor Tony does actually have some kind of dysphoria. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, since the it may hot- or may not be trans, it's not very, it's not super clear. Yeah, it's not really clear yet. We are getting into the fact that there is a dysphoria, so there's mm-hmm. something. Um, yeah, since the hot shot, Bobby C. Oh, it was Doctor Woe, not Doctor Wu. Um, yeah, he has completely avoided that side of town and the mere sight of an Asian or Oriental, as the book says, gives him heart palpitations. That part didn't age very well, but okay. Right. Um, so he has switched to cough syrup. He hasn't been doing well kicking. He weighs 110 pounds and his skin is the color of summer squash living in a dumpster. Um, so I have right here, I've been doing a uh, word of the week because this book is very big on its weird obscure lexicon mm-hmm. we have neurasthenic n-e-u-r-a-s-t-h-e-n-i-c used here in the relation as with poor tony's relation to ants quote which insects poor tony has ever since a neurasthenic childhood fear and detested in particular neurasthenia is defined an ill-defined medical condition characterized by lassitude fatigue headache and irritability associated chiefly with disturbance again this is part of the reason i think this is just a poorly written book because unless this character at some point has a backstory of being the child of a linguist there's no reason to use that particular term here aside Mm. for dfw to jizz on the reader's face with his prowess right yeah uh anyway what do i have here Okay, we go into detail about poor Tony's multiple dripping orifices during withdrawal being extra painful because his orifices dripping makes him think more of his dysphoria. Which, I wonder, if, 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 do you have any idea if that's something that's ever come up in uh, the communities of people with dysphoria that like any kind of like incontinence makes them think more about their dysphoria? Uh, I mean, I have no idea. None of my trans friends have, you know, told me anything about uh, what may or may not be dripping from any part of them (laughs) at any point. Um, Sounds like they're not your real friends, because that's what real friends discuss. (laughs) Right, yeah, just long conversations about what's dripping. Um, (laughs) No, I'm I'm not sure. Like, and I don't know, you know, I'm sure somebody will send you an email talking about how, like, here's a, an exhaustive, li- exhaustive list of David Foster Wallace's trans friends and <laughs> what fluids came uh-huh. from which holes. But uh, See, I, I bring it up just because that's something I wouldn't have thought of before, but I could like, okay, I could see a, a scenario if you already have dysphoria and you're incontinent, that would make mm-hmm. you focus more on the orifice itself and then maybe be more dysphoric. Right, like, if, you're, if you're always thinking about that thing, maybe. It seems exactly. reasonable. Okay, just uh, just just a curiosity. I have them myself. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if it's a thing that he knew I don't, about from talking to somebody, or if he was just like, if he logicked his way through it, and that's kind of what he arrived at. Yeah, um, I would be I would be very surprised if he actually got that from a source and didn't just think it up. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, he didn't even bother to find a black person. So so who you know? Yeah. So why is he going to go out of his way to find a trans person? Good enough. Yeah. Um, I actually have a line I like really much here. Uh, Like really much here. Okay, I did not graduate with a bachelor's. Uh, In regards to his inability to cop heroin, a good line here. Quote, his entire set of interpersonal associations consisted of persons who did not care about him, plus persons who wished him harm, which made me want to bring up this musical cue. Cut my life into pieces. This is my yeah, no one's looking out for you. It's yeah. so, it's, I just thought, like, that's a good line, but that is so fucking emo. Like, everyone right. around me either doesn't care or wants to hurt me. Right. Um, <laughs> and side note, Last Resort, uh, you know, in sixth grade, it was, like, the most badass song. But, uh, you know, as an adult, like, if you listen to the lyrics, um, it's like, um, would it be wrong, would it be right if I took my life tonight? Because chances are that I might. Yeah. Like, probably, maybe. Chances are, it's like, a, there's a very good chance that I might do it. <laughs> um, and then, like, you know, in the hook where he's like, I'm running and I'm crying. Funniest combination of actions. <laughs> running and crying at the same time is not badass and is, no. in fact, 
fucking hilarious. That's one of the funny things about a lot of the old new metal stuff. Because, like, you go back, there are points within the same Linkin Park song where they are alternately mm-hmm. saying, leave me alone, you don't understand me. And then the next verse is, you don't pay enough attention to me. It's like, which... Right. It's like being a cat or a teenager. Exactly. Which, I, I gotta be honest. Looking back, I came up with a lot of the new metal stuff. Honestly, in retrospect, I'm kind of resentful that I was sold sadness porn when I was the most susceptible to it. Like, oh, yeah. I, I, I really, that, that's kind of fucked up in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Just, ugh. It, it, it fucking cut my wrist. I remember when I first heard, uh, this is more on the emo side, when I first heard that Hawthorne Heights song, mm-hmm. the, the, the line is literally, so cut my wrists and black my eyes. Yeah, like, we made fun of that one a lot. I was in the punk scene, mm-hmm. so, like, I missed a lot of, you know, uh, that stuff, unless it was us making fun of it Mm -hmm. in our MySpace bulletins and whatnot, (laughs) you know, or on the NC Punk online message board. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I get back to this. Uh, So he says the reason for codeine is that a tiny percentage gets metabolized into good old C-17 morphine, affording an agonizing hit of what real relief from withdrawal would be. Again, not a fact the character would know. Just gets slapped on him by DFW to let you know how smart he is. Right. Uh, his experience of time passing in a dark, unlit toilet is described as time passing with its own shape and color. The only distraction from his terrible withdrawal uh, that he ever had the hubris to say he'd been, quote, chilled to the bone before feeling this literal sensation at its worst. I think that's a, that was a good point there. Oh, yeah, where they talk chill to the bone, the quote here. Shard studded columns of chill entering to fill his bones with ground glass, hearing his joints glassy crunch with every slightest shift. You know, I always think of uh, having your heart broken being one of those things that, like, we hear is, like, a term, but then you're actually shocked when you do get your heart broken and you're like, oh, my God, my chest physically hurts. Like, yeah. Like, realizing just the truism of an old cliche like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, did, I did think, like, you know, I thankfully have never been a, an opiate guy, but I've seen, um, you know, I, I had friends, I've had friends, you know, die from that shit, and other ones, you know, repeatedly try to, you know, kick the habit, and... Uh, from what little I know, the withdrawal, like it, it seems like a pretty good description of, of withdrawals. Like they seem fucking so miserable. Like, you know. Yeah, they sound ridiculous. terrible. Like, and I can imagine how even like thinking of, uh, you know, being in the midst of this problem and then thinking like, you know, of even quitting one day and just remembering that little bit of withdrawal, how that really prevents people from like not wanting to really face that horrible mountain. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and it's especially difficult. Like it, it mentions that uh, the, a lot of the, the withdrawal problem is, is from the, uh, the alcohol because, mm-hmm. you know, that, that should kill you. Uh, oh yeah. I remember my, my stepdad went away to rehab for alcohol. And apparently one of the things that the old heads said amongst each other is if you locked, a, it, it's a little bit of like, oh, my drug is worse, but they said like, if you, locked up like 10 junkies in one room and 10 out hardcore alcoholics in another room in 10 days when you open the door you'd have 10 dead alcoholics and 10 pissed off junkies that it's, like i mean it's more or less true mm-hmm. like uh when you go you know I, I learned in a you know i took a drugs and behavior class in undergrad and uh you know we, we talked about talked about it in there um and then you know I, I know somebody who ended up in the ICU uh, after alcohol poisoning and had this happen, you know, had the experience of it. Um, so like benzos work on your brain in a very similar way to alcohol. Um, so if you end up, uh, if you're an alcoholic and you end up, you know, in the hospital and they have to detox you, they give you an IV of, you know, uh, benzos uh, to wean you off because otherwise you could, like like uh, poor Tony have seizures and they can be fatal. Um, mm-hmm. So they have to slowly wean you off, and you know they're not going to give you some medical vodka, but they'll put, you know, uh, they'll give you a benzo IV, a benzo drip, and just like 
taper off the dosage um, until your body can handle not having it in there. Right. Yeah. It's uh, alcohol is so weird like that. And that it's that the the main addiction that like tends not to kill people until they're in their sixties yet Mm -hmm. just trying to get off it will fuck you up so bad. It's just interesting chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, So just to finish up this little chunk here, uh, poor Tony just stayed in the stall hallucinating, unable to flush the toilet, to keep up with the demand of the shit running out of his ass. Very graphic little chapter here. Mm-hmm. After a second day without coding, he began to draw from that as well. And that's where we talk about the alcohol. Mm-hmm. So he sat, oh, so he had to get on the train. We get into some of the, tra- uh, the trans stuff dysphoria here. On the train, he sat ugly and disgusting and ashamed and alone when the seizure hit. Didn't realize his silent whimpers were no longer silent. As the seizure hit, he had the bubbling neuron sensation of smelling his father's deodorant, Old Spice. He hit the floor and arched his back, the pressure in his head feeling like the beginning of an orgasm until the pain hit. Hallucinates his friend Bobby sees blood shooting upward and his father kneeling beside him. He swallows his tongue and he hallucinates his father's rubber-gloved hand reaching in to free it when he bites down against his will and tears the father's fingers off. Um, Quite a hellish scene there. We actually don't see ahead and know what was real about that. I'm sure Mm -hmm. we're going to get down to that. Yeah. Any any thoughts on that little chunk that we didn't cover? Uh, I mean, I like it was. I, I thought I actually found that section pretty interesting. Like as much as I like didn't care for a lot of the book, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I would not necessarily go so graphic, uh, right? As as all that, but um, you know, I you, you you feel for this. You feel for this person, and you know, it's it's such a like a. a fucked up position to be in and it's like you know just to see somebody having spiraled out of control and like that relatable like someone having a hard time and everyone on the train is like trying to avoid looking you know that that loneliness of that moment you know and even relatable and even just on way the sadness because like it doesn't seem like poor tony is kicking like they're they're kicking a little bit against their will kind of but i've mm-hmm. always just thought the saddest of that that like people are like, like oh that that drug addict they're fucked up like well no the problem is they're not fucked up right now like mm-hmm. you're unfortunately you're seeing this person as clean as they've been in years and that's unfortunately just something that comes with it right um, okay the next chunk 306 to 311 and this is going to include all of footnote 110 uh, oh, by the way, I will say that if you decide to keep reading with this, the good mm-hmm. parts of this book, there there are exponentially more good parts popping up as we get along. It's okay. just, the the I I think my end result is going. I had a few people on. I think my end judgment is going to be similar to theirs. Where I'm glad I read it. It was a decent book. It's not this incredible thing everybody's fucking crazy about. So, right. I mean, I, I think a lot of it. A lot of the hype, you know, comes from the fact that it is sprawling and, you know, um, you know, that it's, it's so long and there's all these footnotes and it's like, you know, complex in that way. But I don't know, man, I feel like it could have been edited down. Uh, Considerably. Right. And, 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 suppose, and supposedly we're looking at a version edited down 800 pages. That's wild. Crazy. Yeah, and like, you know, it's not like I don't like long books, you know. Stephen King writes long as fuck books, you know. I I haven't read a lot of his stuff, but what I have read has been very long and uh but like very uh entertaining. And obviously this is a different type of book, you know. I'm not saying that very that every author who writes a long book has to be like Stephen King, but you know, I'm I'm just saying uh this could have been that some fat could have been trimmed off this one. Okay, so 306. Uh, Each of the pro-rectors has to teach one academic class per term due for ONANTA requirements to differentiate between being a school and just being a sports academy. We're back at Enfield here. The Mm -hmm. administrators don't take it seriously, but the students clamor to sign up for these classes. Number one, they're incredibly easy to pass. And two, given that the pro-rectors are seen as fuck-ups, the classes tend to be gloriously fascinating crash-and-burn spectacles. A Mary Esther Thode in particular is popular. She'd started as a pupil of Stitt, who had been blacklisted, uh, super hardcore feminist. Her class 
Oh, they specifically say that uh, a group she worked with had been founded on the work of rad femme pioneer Andrea Dworkin, who I, mm. I, I, I'm not big into a lot of the gender studies, but I was aware of Dworkin and uh, her stuff. I, if I recall correctly, she was one of the radical feminists that argued that uh, just due to the inherent nature of like penises and vaginas and how they work, that all sex is rape in one way or another. Mm -hmm. This was not widely bought into, but you know, there it was. Um, right. And like the thing about Dworkin, like um, a lot of, a lot of, I, I haven't read a lot of, you know, Dworkin, but like a lot of, uh, from, from what people, uh, from what smarter people who I trust have told me. Um, that is a great phrase. You should put it on a shirt. <laughs> uh, there, uh, there are, varying levels of um like honest opinion and satire or exaggeration and it all kind of blends together and you, it's not always clear like what's what unless you are more intimately familiar with like her and her body of work um and you know so so i always uh kind of hesitate to give a firm opinion on her given that like i don't know fucking shit about that like i, I uh -huh. you know I, i'm always ready to admit when i don't know something instead of trying to be like you know oh i heard this so here's my fucking solid opinion mm -hmm. well see i only mentioned that i even gave more context than is in the book right there i think the book just mentions was in a book uh that this person was thode thode was in a group that was influenced by the teachings of rad femme philosopher Dworkin and mm -hmm. I just remembered that thing like oh all sex is rape but the reason because it says here that the class that Thode teaches is called the toothless predator breastfeeding as sexual assault so I, I, I saw very clearly like oh that's where they're extrapolating that from mm -hmm. this natural thing while well, of course it's sexual assault uh, which one student Ted Stacked had found to be one of the most disorientingly fascinating experiences of his intellectual life, life thus far Mm -hmm. um, one of the classes she is teaching is the personal, is the political, is the psychopathological. She tries to give the mind riddle of uh, you're an agoraphobic kleptomaniac. So you're compelled to stay in and be afraid of the world because you're agoraphobic, but you're also a kleptomaniac. So you're compelled to go out and steal things. What mm -hmm. do you do? It's just standard, like, you know, riddle type shit that unfortunately does pass for academia in a lot of places. Right. Um, I don't know about you. I actually came up with my own personal answer. If I was an agoraphobic kleptomaniac, did you, how, how did you decide to deal with that? Um, I didn't come up with something. I, I was like, huh, interesting question. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Which is probably the way you should do it. My answer is uh, have a dinner party, invite guests into your home and steal from them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It seems like yeah. we're, we're about answers on the I Hate Infinite Jests podcast. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> go, go into the, you know, oh, can, can I take your coat and then run through it when you say you're going to the bathroom? That, yep. There you go. There yeah, you go. there you, you go. go. Don't have to go out into the big scary world. Still get to steal shit. Um, okay. There is, a tradition bet uh, uh, there is a tradition after big competition periods where students can fuck around on the Academy's radio station. Trolsch in particular is obsessed with this. <laughs> as he wants to be a sportscaster, knowing that he doesn't have what it takes to make it as a player. He pesters the commentators at all the events to try and worm his way in. The bulk of his work involves finding new synonyms for beat and got beat and lose. This chapter includes many skippable chunks of him finding new ways to announce who beat who after a big tournament with wordier and dumber expressions used each time. He, 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 he predicted uh, YouTube uh, titles. Pretty much, yeah. Like, like ben, ben Shapiro eviscerates, destroys. Yeah, leaves decimated and burned down to nothing. Um, you know, as much no, as I he, hate, he, he just he just squeaked awkwardly and like chirped, fucking nonsense quickly enough that people thought he was making a point. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> God, my my girlfriend is far far woker than I am. Way more involved politically, so like I just love fucking with her a little bit. Like the other day, uh, Ben Shapiro appeared on Joe Rogan, 
which Mm -hmm. I don't want. It it comes, the clips come up. My whole thing is I like to, even though I'm far more on the left these days than where I started, I still like to, I, I go to like 4chan and places like that. Just like, let me just see what these idiots are talking about and how, Mm -hmm. how are they processing the world to suit their own needs right now? But I just loved putting on a Ben Shapiro clip and watching what he does. My girlfriend being completely unfamiliar with him, being like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, fuck this guy. Just like, Mm -hmm. just uh, how they try to be so sensible before jumping. Like, and that's why they shouldn't be allowed to vote. Like, you're ugh, fucking idiots. Right. And I, it's always funny to me, like, his publicist must be incredible. Because, like, oh, yeah. like, all the things about, like, oh, he's the cool kid philosopher. It's like, he's, like, four feet tall. Uh, he, his, the way his face moves at all times <laughs> is, like, uh, a school shooter. He looks like a school shooter, and he just, his voice is the worst. Like, I don't understand how anyone can listen to him and be like, yes, I would love to listen to more of this person speaking. This person's voice sounds great to me and I want to hear a lot of it. I should say, in my girlfriend's defense, more so than finding anything he said distasteful, she hated his voice immensely. Just on that point. It's unbearable. Okay, uh, jumping ahead. Uh, the only challenging prorected class Hal has had has been a history of Quebecois rebellion, secession, and return. It is taught entirely in Quebecois French, a language he finds harsh on the ears, which brings us to footnote 110, the single longest footnote at 18 pages long in tiny, tiny font. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a conversation between Hal and, or I, I don't know, I'm jumping ahead. Or- Oren, yeah. It, okay, I couldn't remember if it was that or I was jumping. Well, I, I, and I, I do think that, I think it starts with stuff about, like, uh, the letters that his mom writes and okay. the responses, and then yeah. they're talking and it's revealed that Oren um, fakes the form letters, like, that he actually does right. read the letters, but, like, sends her form letters as a bit. Yeah, like, um, so, so uh, Avril will send messages to him, co- long correspondence, and he will send back through his publicist uh, at this point for the New Orleans Saints, which is pretty much the kind of form, like, you know, thank you for writing to player, and then stamped or an incandenza, like the thing you would send right. out to somebody writing it, like, fan letters. Yeah, but, like, even worse, like, you know, it's not, like, a, a stamp of his name. It's, like, with the fake publicist's name. Like, he couldn't even be bothered to have come up with a form letter or to exactly. pretend to have come up with a form letter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I need to re- – even though we just said this, I need to write the note because I have a terrible joke in it. Uh, we see an example of correspondence between Avril and Oren. This is post himself suicide. By the way, this one footnote contains itself 12 individual footnotes, which I guess makes them toe notes. Okay, I'm proud of myself. Your lack of reaction is correct. Um, <laughs> if I wasn't holding my laptop, I might have given like a polite golf clap. I think that's the appropriate response. So, yeah, that, that, that's a you would you would have jumped up and applauded, but then that would have knocked over your laptop. So you were being polite by holding in your applause. Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, we find out in the note Charles is taking fish oil for high cholesterol. He's so disgusted by the taste that Hal and Mario travel to their house every day just to watch his expression as he takes it. Avril mentions to Oren that she e-ordered him a book, an artery-friendly cookbook, which uh, this is my other thing about David Foster Wallace's fans, is that because she e-ordered him a book, guess what? It's just like Amazon.com, so I guess the future is trademark, just like Infinite Jest. Okay. Amazon existed when Infinite Jest came out. It doesn't matter where he was a prescient genius futurologist, and that's why the future is just like Infinite Jest. Sorry, I, I read right. that so much, <laughs> and it's so fucking... There's two TVs in the same room. It's just like Infinite Jest. It's... Ugh, sorry, that is one of my only real remaining pet peeves, is how people want to pretend that he, like, predicted everything. Right. It was, like, 1996. Like, uh, you could have seen a lot of shit coming. Also, by that point, I think that was when the the Amazon, like the famous Amazon Christmas commercial, when they started uh, trying to compete with Toys R Us and selling toys. I think that was 96. 
Um, right. It might have been like 97, but like it's around that time. Like the ordering from Amazon was not a strange concept that like you had to be a, a wizard to, to see coming. Yeah, it's like, uh, like if you were there for the birth of TV when there's three channels, like, yeah, mm-hmm. there's probably going to be a hundred channels one day. That doesn't make you fucking Nostradamus. You saw a pattern and you predicted a little bit. Right. Um, Oren calls Hal. Oren is detailing seduction strategy number seven, which involves wearing a wedding ring, conversing loudly about how great your wife is while still obviously checking out the subject. Um, David Foster Wallace predicted the mystery show on That's VH1 right. in he 2008 predi- or whatever. He predicted pickup artists, truly a genius ahead of his own time. Right. <laughs> um, that, is a, that is a pretty interesting one, though. I, I've never been big on seduction techniques. I wasn't, I, I just failed until I got lucky. So but basically, so, yep. Yeah. Uh, also mentioned strategy four, which is pretending you just dropped out of seminary and gave up a vow of chastity only this afternoon. Mm-hmm. I can see that working. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, yeah, that kind of trick bullshit, like, you know, I, I think really, like, what makes shit like that work is selling it with confidence, mm-hmm. you know? I, mean, I, I, think, I think what a lot of people who, like, got into, like, after reading the, the game in, like, 2007, but, like, never reading the last, like, skipping the beginning where, I've read, I've read that book, like, and people, people saw it as, like, a guide when it's, like, it starts off with, you know, the guy who ended up getting a TV show off of it, mm-hmm. having a fucking breakdown. And it ends with, you know, the author basically being like, and that's how I learned that the thing that was working here was that I became confident and that confidence is a thing people like. Uh-huh. And nobody needs any of this, uh, you know, any of these tricks and bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people are like, okay, but I, I, the tricks and bullshit sound great. Like I will do the tricks and, and bullshit. Oh god! And because they like had something they could like do confidently, they could practice it. And it's like I'm going to do this thing. Mm-hmm. Then suddenly they were acting confidently, and that fooled people into sleeping with them at least one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I have a few thoughts on that. First off, uh, the way the way a lot of people uh, with the game, I feel like that's like a lot of the people who read Fight Club. And the only message they got out of it is like, oh, I should start a fight club. That would be cool. Not noticing like, oh, yeah, no, every, everybody's life fell apart. Like, that's, that's right. the part you're supposed to remember. Yeah. Like, like poor Upton Sinclair when he, he wrote about the jungle and everybody thought like, oh, well, this, nah. anyway, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, this goes back into the incel thing. How like I feel bad mm-hmm. for these guys because like, yeah, it's a little pathetic, but like they're working with the tools they got. They're trying to figure it out. And especially, right. like, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of women complain, like, uh, like pickup artist types. Like, well, it, it, listen, they're, they're lame, but at a certain point, don't you have a little bit of responsibility? Like, it, shouldn't you have something to say other than you tricked me into liking you? You know, like, don't you have your own little responsibility there a little bit? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but I think a lot of the, a lot of the, I think a lot of the hatred toward pickup artists, aside from like the mentality behind a lot of those people, um, is like fucking negging. Yeah, which is the worst. Um, you know, I feel like aside from that, like, you know, I don't remember fucking what the techniques that they use or anything are. You know. Um, I, I like, remember I remember peacocking and I still go by peacocking a little. Just have just have something that just like pops on you a little bit. Which, right. Again, like, make yourself guess. noticeable is like a thing that makes sense. Right. Um, but that's the thing. If you have no fucking style, like that is something you kinda need to be told. Right. Now I, I, I think that uh, you know, the whole wearing a fucking fuzzy top hat or whatever that dude was doing is uh stupid as shit. But like, you know, make yourself stand out, I feel like is fair advice. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. I mean, honestly, like, yeah, most of the problem is, like, the mentality behind the whole thing uh, and, like, their treat, views treating, on women, not, yeah, treat, like... Treating women like something to be acquired and not their own personal living, breathing. Right, but, like, the motivation to, you know, uh, change your life if you're someone who, like, wants companionship in some form and is not getting it, you know, that the motivation to do so makes sense. It's just, you know, it's another case of, of like a toxic community uh, filling 
or appearing to fill like a need uh, mm -hmm. that vulnerable young people have. Yeah, nah, I, I get it. Um, ooh, about the one strategy, I think this is a great point uh, that Hal says to Oren about the pretending to be married, that there's something pretty sick about having to s invent someone you love to seduce someone you never will. I thought mm -hmm. that was a very good interesting. Yeah. Um, trying to think. I I I'm looking at some of these notes thinking like I could skip some of this. Uh, says Hal injured a kid named Pemberton's eye with a tennis ball. The low-ranked C kids are playing the A kids this week for the C's benefit, though also for the A's to bulldoze. Apparently some staff thought the A's looked tentative and hesitant, so they want to give them some easy wins to get their confidence up, even though it meant some of the C's, like Pemberton, may have a detached retina. Uh, Hal asked Oren if the wheelchair people have still been stalking him. Oren says he hasn't seen one in days. We get to see how terrible Oren is because Oren thinks that maybe the amount of wheelchair people following him have something to do with people who are missing legs looking up to him for having the ultimate leg as a punter. It's pretty sick. It's pretty fucked yeah. up. <laughs> and, um, so when he's saying the wheelchair people, does he mean like literally people in wheelchairs or is it um, the like Quebecois like terrorist group or whatever? Or is he, it just like a, it, it, an it, attempt at like a bit? From, from what we know right now, it is the Quebecois wheelchair assassins. He mm -hmm. doesn't realize that's who it is yet. He just notices like, I keep seeing people in wheelchairs around me like suddenly for no reason and it's noticeable, but I don't know what's happening. So, right. so, yeah, so we, the reader, realize that's what's happening, but he does not know yet. Gotcha. Um, Oren asks Hal to keep an eye out for Helen Steeply at Enfield. We've met Helen a few times. Helen Steeply is Hugh Steeply. He is a spy. He is a man in drag. He has been portrayed as looking nothing like a woman whatsoever with a skew tits and whatever. Yet we find out from Oren that Oren and all his fellow football, player, football players are strangely attracted to her and trying to bang her, which is interesting. Um, oh, so O needs, Oren needs how to answer some questions a subject asked him, and he needs to pretend to be caring. First asks the definition of the word samizdat. Hal says it's Russian. It means self-published, but it was specifically used for anti-government publications that are below the standard press. No U.S. equivalent with the First Amendment. Specifically would have to be incendiary. Apparently, Samizdat was used in some relation to himself, the, the father. Something related to Quebecois separatism. It, overall, we're getting the fact that this spy is questioning Oren for something. He's trying to get some details, but Oren is so used to lying to women that he's looking for lies and it's a, it's a whole clusterfuck. Sorry. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a particularly rough week on the notes. You never know what's important or what's not. Um, da, 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 da. Oren is worried. Helen will try to get to Hal on the grounds and interview him instead. Hal points out that unlike the days of their father's reign, they go out of their way to avoid journalism and hype these days. Uh, Oren reveals he's been talking to Helen Steeply himself. Helen is the current subject. Uh, we also, I don't know if you notice this, but David Foster Wallace is known for starting sentences with, and so, but when. I, I didn't notice that. He does it a lot. He does a lot in this chapter, but so, but then. Um, oh, okay. I think you meant the specific phrase. Yeah, no, I did, I did notice that. Yeah, he, he, starts, he starts with a conjunction. Right, which, he's, which he uses across multiple characters, which, again, any other author would be termed like, oh, this isn't the tick of this specific character. This guy's just a bad writer and can't help putting it everywhere. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. Uh, Hal lights into Oren a little bit that this subject seems different than the rest. Oren is trying too hard. He admits she's grown on him, not like the other subjects. He throws out that his teammates call him the home wrecker for his lust for married women with small children. Uh, that he's disowned his mother, convinced himself she was at fault for everything with the father's death. Oren admits she showed her photos of her giant children and that got him going. That's an interesting little thing there, I guess. Mm. I don't know. Do you have anything to interject? I feel like I'm bulldozing through these notes just because there's so many of them. The, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very long thing. I, yeah, I, I didn't... Um, like... I found I found the whole thing just like kind of obnoxious, and then when when Hal's like, 
it's weird that you're calling your little brother and talking about like try like all of your fucking weird pickup tactics to like fuck women. I'm like, yep, that's kind of what I was thinking. How? Yeah. Like, um, yeah, I just like Oren. I feel like he's not interesting enough to be as shitty as he is. I uh, the way I'm feeling it is I feel like he's shitty and he knows he's shitty and he's just gotten so used to lying that he's actively calling his brother like you know what what, what do I tell them about myself because I have nothing nice to say about myself so what do I tell them right so yeah I mean I feel like the, there's there's some there's something that could be interesting about that character but like he's not written to be he's not written in a very interesting way I feel like there's you know. Hal, for all of his, like, you know, bootleg Holden Caulfield bullshit, like, mm. is at, <laughs> that's at least... A, that's a very good way to describe him, actually. Yeah, like, he's, like, uh, like a mix of, of um, mostly Holden Caulfield with a little bit of uh, Jason Schwartzman in Rushmore. Mm. I, can um, see, I can see that a lot. Okay. Yeah. But, like, you know, he's at least written in a compelling way where it's, like, I find this kid utterly obnoxious, but, like, Sure, like I still feel for him at times, mm-hmm. or and I'm just like, man, there's an idea here, but the execution is is uh, fucking lacking. Yeah, I- agreed. Oren is just like, ugh, just like it, it, even your bad guy has to be so fucking snooty and overly intellectual and wrapped up in his own bullshit. Like just ugh. right, like you know, and he's like an NFL player who's like. What NFL player have you ever seen talking anything like that? Which is funny because Dave Foster Wallace actually mentions that in an essay about uh, Mary Austin that I found very interesting. So she was a tennis player. And the basic paradox he talks in there that I found fascinating is the reason we read these sports autobiographies is we want to get in the head of somebody who has reached the peak, like, of physical perfection and competition. So we mm-hmm. read this because we want to know about that. However, the paradox is that to have that much commitment to achieving peak perfection and competition, you need to be so not self-conscious that you don't think about the machinations that go into it. Mm-hmm. More or less making it an eternal mystery because the people who want to know can't experience it and the people experience it specifically have to ignore it to achieve that level. So. That, I mean, that makes sense. Like, looking, um, I watched the 10 hour fucking uh, The Last Dance on Netflix. Oh, yeah, the Michael Jordan thing. Michael yeah. Jordan thing. I mean, it's about the Bulls in general, but, you know, obviously Michael Jordan was uh, key to that mm. team in that era. Um, I'm, I'm not a sports guy, uh, but, like, it's just a well, it's well done enough that I was able to, to, to just pound through it. But, mm. um, you know, there's a part where they're talking about Michael Jordan in that way, where it's just like he, they're like he's basically he's, he has like the the presence mentally of like a fucking buddhist monk like he is mm. you know he doesn't think about the past or the future in the moment because like he's so focused on what he has to do in that in that moment mm. um and obviously they had uh more and, and more detailed things to say about that but you know I think that relates to yeah what you were saying about um I think one of the athletes of that level one of the fascinating things I heard about Michael Jordan was uh what a bad teammate he was that he would get furious at his other teammates and I think somebody gave it the diagnosis that like he doesn't understand like why everybody can't just be as good as him so or 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 work the way he does cuz like yeah like you watch this thing and he's just like you know berating everybody if they're not working as hard as he thinks they should because he you know like like when he when he didn't make varsity in high school um you know they were like you're not really up to that level you need to work on it and he spent the whole summer like playing some ridiculous amount every day like mm-hmm. all day every day like his parents said that like they unless he was eating or sleeping or taking a shower. Like they never saw the basketball leave his hands for the whole Mm -hmm. summer. Um, And so when people aren't willing to do that, he like flips out on them. Right. Uh, And like there's a season, like when he retired uh, and went into baseball, like, you know, and Scottie Pippen basically becomes the team leader. Like, you know, everybody's talking about like 
how they like the morale was so much higher everybody like had a good time because <laughs> scott like people would fuck up and like be you know pavlo like, have a pavlovian response of being ready to be you know berated uh-huh. he's like it's okay bud you know <laughs> like you, everything's okay i'm scotty pippen like we'll we'll be fine let's uh let's go let's go play some basketball and have fun out there we're making uh, a lot of money mm. and you know, then Michael Jordan comes back and is like, fuck you, work hard. We have to play 800 <laughs> hours a day. If you're not bleeding, you're not doing well enough. God. Yeah, it, it does go to show that, like, the people who try so hard to achieve this level, when they achieve that level, they don't seem any happier for it. It's just an eternal torture to always get better and best yourself. Right, yeah. All right, uh, to get back to this real quick, so Hal, uh, so uh, Helen Steeply, Hugh Steeply, is asking Orin a lot of questions about Quebec. Seems to be hinting at stuff with, uh, you know, he's trying to get at. Um, it seems like the mother Avril has something to do with the Quebecois movement, so he's mm-hmm. trying to get information on that. Hal is getting furious about, you know, oh, asking all these questions. Why is he going to such lengths? Why can't he just admit this is about his mother? Why can't he admit it to himself over the fucking phone? Uh, the, the crux of what they're asking is Quebec has always been trying to be separate from Canada, but now everything got mushed together, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Why are they not? Now they're like fighting for Canada, and Hal's overall thing is saying that the Quebecs just got fucked over, and they have feral hamsters and giant toddlers and Godzilla-sized monster lobsters, and Quebec needs to get away from that. There's a lot. There's a lot of shit going on in there. Um mm. All right, I have more for that section, but we basically have it covered. Okay. Uh, we have some details on the FLN, the Assassins de Fatul Rolens techniques, the wheelchair assassin, assassins. A favorite technique is to stretch a long mirror across a roadway right around a dangerous turn so that drivers think they're playing chicken with somebody, turn off a ravine suddenly. Uh, these kinds of things happened for months before people caught on that it was terrorist in nature. And now we get into that shit about Mario, that Mario was a surprise. Avril had not shown any baby bump, had maintained her menstrual cycle. And then in November, seven months into her unknown pregnancy, grabbed her arm with a sudden pain and noticed her water had broken. James, the father, was drunk, thought she was dying. The fact that this happened on a staircase didn't help matters, as his father had also died on a staircase. Uh, Say Mario had to be scraped out of his mother like oyster meat. He'd been clinging to his mother's womb like a spider. We're getting a lot of gross stuff again here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like I can skip a lot of the physical stuff just because you and I already hit on that. Yeah, yeah. Just um, you know, he he looks he looks like a like a goomba. He's like a, a small little like, like a like a like a goomba child, uh, little little lizard man mm-hmm. with dolphin teeth. <laughs> But despite all that, Mario is beloved, or at least his presence is appreciated. The lower class shop keeps in town love him. When the groups go to Denny's, the kids fight for who gets to pre-cut up his meal for him. Hal secretly idealizes him for his ability to not care about the misfortune fate put on him and still be kind to rise above it. Hal feels that fears that his mother sees Mario as the real prodigy and unclassifiable genius. That she does her best to leave Mario alone, Hal believes, because her true instinct is to forever smother him in mother's love and pity and affection, which would only make Mario feel bad for her. And yeah, that's what I have for that little section there. Any anything else about you got about Mario? Um, I did think it was interesting, like the whole thing about um, Hal uh, idealizing him, because mm. it's you know it's such like a little brother to big brother thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no matter what your big brother does on some level, you're always going to have, you know, that level of respect. Like that's your, your big fucking brother. Mm-hmm. Um, even if he's a tiny, tiny, uh, goblin man, um, <laughs> you know, that's still, still your, your big bro. And, you know, you're gonna, you grow up trying to emulate in different ways. And also like, I think it's interesting, uh, that he, envies his ability to be kind mm-hmm. um because sometimes that's relatable like if your instinct is to you know if your if your defense mechanism is to to be you know sarcastic or, or what have you just like you know to 
see friends or, or acquaintances or whoever, family members, whoever, who like go through the world just being pleasant mm -hmm. and look and go like, man, my life would be much better if my brain let me do that. That seems cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, again, people have told me a lot, uh, fans of this book, have told me repeatedly that Mario is like the only kind, good person in the entire book, which I guess is the need, why he, David Foster Wallace felt the need to make him so physically grotesque to make up for his heart. Because I guess he's just not an interesting, wouldn't be an interesting protagonist. But. If he was just like a nice, just a nice boy. Yeah, just just a nice mutant boy. Just right. like those those poor incels, they're they're just nice and they want to help people, but they're just so grotesque. That's that's <laughs> what happened there. Okay, uh, we come back to Maraith and Steeply again. The uh, Maraith is one of the wheelchair assassins. Steeply is the spy in drag that Orin is now in love with. We mm -hmm. continually see them in this waiting for Godot scenario where they're on the outskirts of Tucson watching it burn, and they're just arguing about spy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, they're arguing about the entertainment film Infinite Jest. Mm -hmm. Maraith argues that it is made by an American towards American ideals, refers to it as Samizdat, which we just learned the term before. Says, mm -hmm. of course, Americans would let their children die for an entertainment such as this. Argues how much America could be worth. Would they be willing to leave their loved ones and limbs for their country when they can be sublimated by a film cartridge when the temptation for Infinite Jest is available? Steeply says, you're saying the administration wouldn't even be concerned about the entertainment if we didn't know we were fatally weak. Maraith responds, the simple fact that we're so susceptible means we're walking dead already. Therefore, it doesn't matter if they kill more of us if we're so willing and prone to give up on life so easily anyway. I mean, I, I understand some of this, particularly as it regards to people falling into the comfortable slumber of entertaining themselves as opposed to going through any of the growing pains of like, accomplishing something or starting a project mm -hmm. i don't know you have any you have any thoughts on that i think of a lot of my stoner friends who felt they were expanding their mind and instead just were watching cartoons on a couch and then they just stopped growing at that point right i mean yeah it's 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 easy to spiral in into you know that into getting distracted by you know okay uh, i'm just gonna watch an episode of this and then i'll start writing and then you know 30 days later, uh, you know, you've watched like 15 full series, you know. Um, but, you know, I, like it, it's, it's, it's a, it, it aligns a lot with like the, you know, the more Huxleyan dystopic view, you know, like where it doesn't have to be, uh, where like the, uh, the dystopian ruin doesn't have to be brutally administered mm -hmm. the people just have to be given you know bread and circuses basically mm -hmm. um well i know that's been a lot of things over the recent years with the rise of like cell phones and privacies and like data stealing is that mm -hmm. we all looked at like uh we, we all thought government surveillance was going to be like tyrannical the way 1984 prescribed whereas it, they just made it really entertaining for us and now we carry it around with it ourselves we willingly mm -hmm. give it up right and honestly i think it's both because um you know it, it's funny like the first time i in some class you know in high school or undergrad or wherever was you know there was this discussion of like you know will a dystopian future look you know like brave new world or like 1984 and i was like both like they don't, they're not mutually exclusive things. Like, you know, we right now have a regime that, you know, not to fucking harp on the thing that we are all constantly talking about fucking anyway, but like, you know, they, they are constantly redefining reality and, yeah. you know, uh, changing terms to mean things they don't fucking mean. And, you know, uh, sending, you know, unmarked, troops into cities to gas and beat citizens into submission mm -hmm. clearly there's like that authoritarian element but also we are being constantly like we're constantly inviting you know surveillance into our lives for the sake of uh having these these, these uh forms of entertainment Right. It's just the user which by the way if you're listening to this in the future we are recording this literally like 
within a week of uh, the unmarked federal agents going into Portland unidentified and just kidnapping people off the streets. So, yeah, yeah, very important right now. I, oh God, November 3rd, please, please, please. I can't get here quick enough. Um, well, actually, not even November 3rd, because then we still have to wait until January to wonder what the, what the fuck that twist ending is going to be. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I don't think that much will, will change if Biden wins. But uh, I think uh, it'll be a more poignant message when the left doesn't just chill the fuck out. Right. When it's like, oh, like this is we're not just chilling out because somebody, you know, ostensibly closer to our to our ideology is in power now. Like the, the issue is the actions, not like what color your tie is on the debate stage. Right. Yeah. Like that's uh, my uh, my whole thing right now. I'm I am not voting for Biden. I am voting for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's replacement. That is who I am voting. for. I, I, th- I think that is that is fair. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, all right, we're almost wrapping this up here. Uh, Marath and Steeply continue arguing. The USA deserves this for telling people to move away from temples and patriotism and choose instead to worship selfish, empty, hollow entertainment as a means to happiness. Steeply points out that Quebec then wants to dictate to its citizens to go against their own desires, uh, choosing bad things. That's just a feature and responsibility of being free. One can't be human without freedom. So they're, yeah, they're doing the back and forth of what is freedom exactly? Marath mm. points out that a father guiding principle is necessary, that a free child will only choose candy and not bread and soup and meat and vegetables and things that are good to it. That patriotism is that guiding principle. Without it, without it the child may be free, but they are weak and sickly. Steeply responds, the difference is Americans don't consider themselves children. Marath gets angry. Steeply responds, that's what Marath does. He puts words in Steeply's mouth, says them for him, and then gets mad as if Steeply himself said it, which, as Steeply points out, is the emotional recklessness of a child. I wrote all this not realizing a big chunk of my afternoon was going to be arguing with a libertarian in the fucking first place. Like, this was foreshadowed, and I did not predict it, and I did not expect it. Yeah, well, I mean, David Foster Wallace, he predicted Twitter. Uh, He predicted Twitter. He (laughs) predicted... He he predicted Parasite winning the best Oscar. Right. He, yeah. he did. He did all of it. Um, you know, uh, he predicted 9-11, but he didn't stop it. Um, a monster, as he is. Right, a Mar- yeah. <laughs> a Mario Incandenza-esque monster, for right. sure. Just a little goblin man. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's it. That's it. Those are our notes for this week. It, it's so weird doing it with this book that doesn't have solid chapter endings. And it just mm-hmm. like kind of, it's just little vignettes. So it's, sometimes it's, we just stop right there. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, like, and you know, I, I, to an extent, like I wish I had finished it. Like, so I used to work at, I used to work at a luxury hotel. Um, okay. And um, I don't remember if it was like, if the movie had come out already or if it was a trailer, if it was just announced, but like, um, like Jason Siegel used to stay there a lot. And oh. so, um, you know, if I remember correctly, part of the reason that I was reading it, cause me and him used to talk about books a lot. Um, cause like he would sit out out front and just like, you know, chat with us Bellman a lot. Um, so we just talk about fucking books. And so, you know, I wanted to, you know, see what his fucking opinion was, but I wanted to, have some idea of what I was talking about. I just never did. And I never talked to him about it, but uh, you know, um, did you ever watch, did you see that movie? I haven't seen it. I, I did it. Uh, I, I watched that. I think I was only on episode one or two and mm-hmm. I had a very definitive idea of who David Foster Wallace was. And that was not the guy on screen at all. But then I read some articles that were like, well, yeah, but that wasn't really him either. Like it was, they, they, they right. did they did kind of lionize him a little bit and the little bit they put in of his bad side was like, they kind of glossed it over to look like something else. Like, right. That's, I heard, I heard kind of similar things, but I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Well, it's, he very specifically uh, pulls Jesse Eisenberg's character aside at one point to be like, Hey, don't 
don't hit on my lady friends. That's weird. You're here as like, you know, to interview me. And if I'm inviting you into their house, that's a little strange. And then to read afterward, like, oh no, he just didn't like any competition from any man when it came to women around him. Like that's what that was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'd like to, my, right now, my big goals for this podcast are to get Michael Schur on, who was the creator of Parks and Rec and loves Mm -hmm. Infinite Jest and get Jason Siegel on. I don't expect to accomplish either. But mm-hmm. couldn't hurt to fucking try. You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, like, if you somehow got in touch with Jason Siegel, like, he doesn't seem to that he'd be a hard get in the sense that, like, he's a super fucking nice dude. Oh, yeah. Um, and he likes talking about books, which is what this is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't know how you'd get in touch with him. He's, uh, especially, he's not, like, very online. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know... I mean, I've, I've, I would listen I, to that episode. Yeah, well, I, that that would I hope, but yeah, I I think I'm gonna reach out to some of their representation and really take advantage of the fact that this COVID thing, nobody's really doing shit. Yeah, everyone's you know? probably pretty fucking bored right now. Exactly, like anything to keep your, you know, uh, what's the word, visibility up. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mr. Stevie McFly, I think uh, we're wrapped up. I, I think we have done what we came here to do, and. We talked about this chunk of Infinite Jest. That having re- did you read this? Uh, did you get this far before in your first attempt? Um, I don't think so. And uh-huh. you know, my my brain has kind of overwritten a lot of uh, my previous attempt. But like, right. I don't think I got quite this far. Okay. Do Do you have any temptation to continue now that you have read reread this part, and now that you've read this part? Not specifically, but I, I may at some point do it like chunk by chunk out of curiosity. I am like, okay. you know, uh, and to just say that I fucking did it. So that, yeah. you know, when I get a flood of uh, angry emails for, for my, <laughs> my shit talk that I can be like, no, I, I did fucking read it, man. Like I, I, I just didn't like it. Uh, that's the whole reason I started this podcast. Cause I knew enough people who really liked it. And it wasn't just that I didn't like it. I didn't understand what anybody liked about it. So I really, the whole crux of this thing is so I can argue with people from a knowledgeable, like, no, I read the whole book. It sucks. I will argue with it still. So right. I am, I am very motivated by spite, it would seem. It's a strong motivator. There you go. Whatever gets us there. Yeah. So, Stephen McFly, thank you for appearing with us again. Uh, Thanks for having me. Anywhere we can find you, anything to plug, social media. Yeah, uh, like I said before, uh, I'm on Twitter, um, Stevie X McFly, and same for Instagram, but I almost never use Instagram, uh, but I'm on both. All right, perfect. Well, Stevie McFly, I will now press the stop recording thing, but you and I will talk a bit more. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.